Um, all right. Good afternoon. I'm Senator, State Senator Nancy Skinner for the East Bay, and this is our 10th town hall virtually. Of course, now that with COVID, we're doing everything virtually, and I'm very pleased that you are joining us today. And because the rate of in, the COVID infection has become so severe, such large numbers in uh in our region, in California, and across the country. It has resulted in our public health officials asking us all now to do a stay at home order again and really restricting very similar restrictions to that which we went under back last March when the uh, pandemic first started. And I know that this is frustrating for a lot of folks, um, but I think if we were to talk to those people who work in hospitals, they are so concerned right now. The number of beds that are taken up in the ICU units by COVID patients is just a huge number at the moment. And obviously there are other health conditions that people have. If you have a heart attack, if you have a stroke, if you, there's so many other incidents where we need ICU capacity. And so the, our public health officials felt very strongly that we all needed to basically uh, really pull back on our activities in order to protect our hospitals. And, but I know people are, have questions about this order, they are frustrated. And so my staff and I put together this town hall and I'm gonna introduce for you in just a moment who's gonna be speaking in it. So that, and then um, after our folks talk a little bit, I've got a whole set of questions that once we announce this town hall, you all emailed us with questions and I'm gonna pose them to those who have joined us so that um, we can get those questions answered. And the things that we can't get to, my staff will do their best to email you back and answer those questions. So let me then indicate who we have joining us today. We have Dr. Nicholas Moss, who is the public health officer for Alameda County's Department of Public Health. And he's been part of the county's COVID-19 response since it started, um, he is an infectious disease specialist and a medical epidemiologist. And he first joined Alameda County's Public Health Department in 2013 as the director of the HIV and STD section. He also previously worked at the San Francisco Department of Public Health. So we'll have Dr. Nicholas Moss. We also have Dr. Noha Aboleta. Abo and she is the CEO and founder of the Roots Clinic here in East Oakland. And Roots, she's also the uh, um, head of the Roots Community Health Alliance, which is a professional association of safety net providers who are committed to the care of underserved. And so Dr. Noha has been directly uh, providing care and treatment and testing services and much, much more to East Oakland residents. So we will hear from her. And then we have, uh, I didn't mention at the beginning that besides the stay at home order and the situation of COVID, we're also gonna talk about the vaccine because believe it or not, vaccines are gonna be arriving in California already this month. And so we have Dr. Robert Wachter, who is from, uh, he is the professor and chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. And his department leads the nation in the number of grants from the National Health Institute that they've received. It is ranked as one of the best departments in the US. And he, since the start of the pandemic, his tweets on COVID-19 have been viewed over a million times, a hundred million times, not 1 million, 100 million times. <laughs> so I'm very pleased that Dr. Uh, Wachter, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, has uh, joined us. So I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of update on the uh, vaccine and the virus before I get into the stay-at-home order. And I know that the stay-at-home order is the thing that's frustrating everyone, but I figured we'll, we'll hear some of the good news or mixed news first. So Dr. Wachter, you wanna start and give us a little overview on the vaccine. Sure, Senator, thank you for the opportunity to 
speak to uh, uh, your constituents and, and uh, with this esteemed group. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, pull up a few slides just to kind of take you through where we are now, which is really an extraordinary phase of the uh, of the pandemic. So um, let me start. I've been starting all my talks this way to check in and be sure people are doing okay. Uh, I do this now with the Fauci scale. So this is, uh, this is Fauci at five different stages of, of the past year. And um, as terrible as things are, I'm, I'm now a Fauci 1.8 because the news about the vaccine is actually extraordinarily good. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to muddle through some tough times over the next few months, but it is really uh, very hopeful. I'll get to that in a second. Here's the big challenge, and I think Dr. Moss will understand this and lives this every day. This is a former Secretary of Health, uh, Mike Levitt, once said, everything we do before a pandemic will seem alarmist. Everything we do after will seem inadequate. And I would sort of add to that the alarmist piece is sometimes what you have to do during a pandemic may seem like overkill, but you're always behind the curve here because of the nature of this virus. It's sort of like looking at a star. What's happening now happened two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And so you're always chasing your tail a little bit. You're always a little bit behind. And so what might seem like a very aggressive move is actually a perfectly appropriate move, given what we know. And I'll, I'll spend a minute or two on that. So here is the issue of the moment where everybody's unhappy and and uh, fatigued uh, for having been at this now nine or 10 months. The fact we're now back to something that's not quite March, but, uh, but a lot closer than we hoped we would be. Uh, and the reason, of course, is this. The reason is that we are having a real live surge in the Bay Area and in California. We're starting to see the spike in deaths that one sees after seeing a spike in cases and then a spike in hospitalizations. I can tell you at UCSF Medical Center, where a month ago we had 8 to 10 COVID patients. Uh, today we have over 40. We have 10 on ventilators when we had one or two uh, a month ago. And that num those numbers are just going north. And, uh, and as hospitals get overfilled, bad things happen, as you mentioned, Senator, not just for our care of COVID patients, but for our care of patients with strokes and heart attacks and other infections. And so taking this seriously is absolutely the right thing to do. And uh, although I'll let Dr. Moss answer all the questions about uh, that you will have about about the rules. So um, I, 2020 obviously stinks, but uh, last month uh, it began to feel like it was 2021 when the vaccine news started coming out. And if look at the date, it's November 9th. So what's really interesting, we sort of forget this, but but one month ago today, we did not know whether there would be a vaccine that worked. Not worked 95% of the time, just worked, period. And um, it wasn't a slam dunk. You know, we've been looking for an HIV vaccine for 40 years. We don't have one. We've been looking for a TB vac vaccine for 100 years. We don't have one. And so the first news of the Pfizer vaccine that came out saying that it looked to be 95% effective. And then the Moderna vaccine news came out a week or two later saying it, too, was about 95% effective. And then Pfizer came out with additional results and some more have come out in the past day. And they're all uh, remarkably consistent. We now have seen pretty much all of the Pfizer data. Uh, th these are as good as it gets in terms of vaccines. They prevent 19 out of 20 infections. And I think the most impressive piece of data is when you add up Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, now they've, they, they've had more than 50,000 patients in their studies. There were 40 patients that had severe cases of COVID, severe enough to go to the hospital, or to, uh, or to die or go to the ICU or require a lot of oxygen. Of those 40 patients who had that severe case of COVID, it turned out 39 of them had received the placebo. One of them had received the vaccine. And from Pfizer's uh, news this morning, it turned out that one who had received the vaccine had a fairly mild case of severe COVID, if that makes any sense. Uh, his or her oxygen level went relatively low, but was not sick enough to go to the ICU. So it seems to be virtually 100% effective in preventing severe cases of COVID, which is remarkable. They also appear to be extraordinarily safe. We'll get to that, I'm sure, with the questions. But other than some short-term day or two side effects of fever and a headache and maybe some arm pain, there really is no indication of long-term and severe side effects from these vaccines. And now they've been studied for several months out in more than 50,000 patients. So I think we're, it's almost, uh, it can almost make one giddy 
compared to where we thought we might be a month ago in terms of how good these vaccines are, how safe they are, and what they will do for the pandemic, but we have to make it through the next several months. So I feel like we're looking at the world through a split screen television, and on the one uh, screen, the news, news is terrible and couldn't really be any more terrible. You see the third spike there, that, that blip down was artifactual, let's back up again. And we have patients in ICUs, dying, uh, patients dying all over the country, about 2,000 a day, 2,500 a day. One day we hit nearly 9-11 levels of deaths in a single day. And on the other hand, you have this news about the vaccine. So it's really hard for a human brain to kind of wrap around both the terrible news and the good news that is coming. How's the vaccine going to work? We can get into this in more detail uh, in the questions if you want, but just, just this is my effort to kind of show some of the big picture numbers. We, there are a number of groups that have been prioritized as being higher priority than the average person at low risk. And that I've shown them there, healthcare workers, uh, people in nursing homes, people over 65, people with comorbidities, uh, homeless uh, uh, individuals, incarcerated individuals, all at either at higher risk of getting bad cases of COVID or getting COVID or at higher risk because you have to go out and take care of people with COVID. When you add up all of those groups, that's 144 million people. That's a lot of people. Now, we've prioritized within these groups, and the first groups that will get a vaccine are healthcare workers with direct contact with patients and, and folks in nursing homes, and then it will move on to these other groups. The initial supply of the vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, Pfizer will get approved next week. It's looking like Moderna probably the week after. And there will be 20 million people that could be vaccinated by the end of this year. So we're talking in the next three weeks uh, with the Bay Area having its fair share of that. And so that should be enough to get through most of the healthcare workers and people in nursing homes, assuming the rollout goes okay. But it isn't until about March or April till you have enough, enough vaccine out there to get all of the people in the high priority groups, over 65 comorbidities, essential workers. And then it's not till about June, July, kind of depends, maybe there'll be more vaccines that come online that will shorten this a little bit, till we get to the number that's known as, high, as, as herd immunity, a pretty familiar term these days. But the thinking is if you can vaccinate about 70% of the population with a highly effective vaccine, you can prevent transmission and the virus begins to die out. So when people think about when could we get back to quote normal, uh, we're really talking about the summer if everything goes well, could be a little bit shorter if we have more vaccines that are approved uh, beyond the initial two, could be a little longer if it takes uh, longer to roll these things out. And you see here the, there's uh, projections that we'll have enough vaccine for the entire uh, population by the end of the year. So we're in kind of another funky period where at the one hand, we're arguing a little bit about who's gonna go first. On the other hand, the biggest question is making sure people will take this vaccine once there's no longer a, uh, a chokehold because of supply. And it is really, really important that people take the vaccine so we can get to this level of herd immunity and, and have uh, the pandemic go away. So spend a minute on the Bay Area. My slides are San Francisco because that's where I live and work, but this really is true for the entire Bay Area, including the East Bay. It's been a remarkable success story, uh, actually the top, the best success story in the entire country, partly because of the work of people like Dr. Moss and others who have done what they need to do to keep us safe. This is just San Francisco. There have been 164 deaths from COVID in San Francisco. Each one a tragedy, but an amazingly a small number when you think about 280,000 deaths in the United States. And if the rest of the country had San Francisco's per capita death rate, we would have had about 180,000 fewer deaths, and probably the same is, is, is true for the East Bay as well. So it's been a remarkable success story. Uh, it may be ending now and if, we, if we're not careful because things are going the wrong direction, but at least so far, it has been a combination of really good leadership and most importantly, really good followership, people doing the right thing when being asked to do that. And I'll just put in a quick plug for UCSF as I end. Uh, I, I'm very proud of my organization, which has sort of redone everything it does clinically, take care of patients. Here's our medical students out there trying to uh, rouse up some PPE early on in the pandemic. These are a bunch of my colleagues who, when it became clear San Francisco was not going to get hammered, the first thing that they said is we want to go someplace to help. And they got on airplanes and flew to New York City and flew to the Navajo Nation uh, where they helped out. Really a remarkable act of charity. This is Joe DeRisi who it took the uh, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and repurposed it into a testing lab, 
early on. This is Diane Havler, one of the world's leading AIDS researchers, HIV researchers, who led a study in the Mission District in San Francisco that demonstrated the um, major disparities in the rates of infection, even in, in relatively low prevalence San Francisco, far more infections in our Latinx uh, and, and other minority communities. Uh, here is me interviewing uh, the mayor of San Francisco and our health director and uh, infectious disease officer uh, uh, about the pandemic. This is a conference I hold every week uh, talking about issues in COVID. And this is the, uh, uh, the Biden-Harris uh, uh, Advisory Council on which three of 13 members are from UCSF. So uh, feeling very proud of my organization's response and really feeling very proud of the Bay Area, which has stepped up to the plate and done the right thing and some of the, the hard things that uh, Nicholas and others are having to do and every, all of us are having to do are just in keeping with trying to continue to do the right thing to save lives until we get through this thing. So let me stop there and thanks again for the opportunity. Dr. Wachter, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna jump into some questions on the vaccine. Sure. We may come back to more questions on vaccine. We'll just ask a few right now before we hear from uh, Dr. Moss and Dr. Abueleta. Um, so vaccine. Um, what we know is that in the Bay Area and other basically most parts of the country in California, those who with the highest death rates are amongst Latinos and Blacks. And um, so, and traditionally, we have gotten a situation where very often medicines and other things are not tested on a diverse enough population. They tend to be tested mostly on white men. And uh, so, of course, if we look at who's getting sick, then I would expect that people would want to know that because uh, you mentioned there were 50,000 people in the trial of the vaccine, was that trial, did it have what you felt were, was adequate diversity from ethnicity point of view, from uh, age point of view, from just all the factors that we wanna um, concern ourselves with? Yeah, no, it's a terrific question. And and to their credit, the, company and the, F the companies and the FDA insisted on that. They knew that this would be the most visible uh, vaccine trial in history, would have to be transparent, and they put out their protocols. In fact, early on, the, I, I think Pfizer was sent back to the drawing board to make sure that it had enough diversity of, in, on, on all those dimensions that you mentioned. And it, when you look at the subgroups, uh, there, there are a, a large percentage of the uh, people in the, in the tr drug trials are from uh, Latinx and, and Black and Asian and other uh, uh, communities. Uh, a large uh, group are from uh, an older patient population, population, which is very important because not every vaccine works as well in older people because our immune systems stop working as well. It turned out every way you slice the data, the vaccines work just as well. Uh, blacks and Latinx versus white, uh, over 65 versus under 65. The only group that has not yet really been tested as younger is, is kids. Children, okay. And, and so that will be important in order to sort out uh, the kids. Although at the end of the day, it may turn out to not be the most important thing because kids have relatively good outcomes with COVID, first of all. And second of all, keeping the kids safe in school is probably more a matter of keeping the amount of infection down in our communities and vaccinating the adults in the schools. So at the end of the day, we'll probably want to vaccinate the kids, but it's, it, it's important uh, we can get the schools open if we keep the rest of the community safe and particularly the older, older individuals in the schools safe. And were, um, were there any uh, pregnant women in the uh, test in this? They were excluded, uh, and it leads to uh, you know questions that people will have about the the safety and pregnancy. In general, it is felt to be safe, and I think the uh, the recommendations of the pregnant women be given the opportunity to either take or not take the vaccine. Um, in you know, in studying the vaccine before you are you know are really sure about it, it often is true that you don't have pregnant women involved in the trial, but that puts you in the current conundrum. And um, uh, every indication is that they are safe. There's no reason to believe they wouldn't be, but it's a, it's a logical concern because it was not tested in them. I don't know if you have anything to add, uh, Nick, if do you, no. So um, obviously the part of the issue around the willingness to get a vaccine is the concerns about was the, not only was the test group large enough, but do, 
has there been enough time to really see whether there's side effects? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. I, 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 so the, here's, here's what we know. And people say, wasn't this rushed? And the answer is no. The answer is it was rushed only insofar as most vaccine development uh, uh, programs take five years because bureaucracy, because the companies don't make a lot of money on vaccines, so they go really slow and they're very risk averse. And if, if there's any signal that things might be going wrong, they'll stall it out for a year and work on something else. This one, what the government got right on this one was to give them enough money to essentially take the risk away from the companies and to help fund the clinical trials, which are hugely expensive, and also to fund the production of the vaccines even before we knew they were going to work. And so if they didn't work, what we would be doing today is taking millions of doses of vaccine and, and throwing them out. So it was a pretty risky thing to do, but really smart that they did that. Other than that, there were no corners cut in the trials. The number of people in the trials, the amount of time that they've watched them for uh, looking for side effects, uh, were all sort of standard the way we do it. What we know is that a decent proportion of people will have a little fever, a little fatigue, a little muscle joint pain, and maybe a little bit of arm pain after the shot, usually after the second shot rather than the first. Other than that, now, there were about 75,000 patients in the trials. About 40,000 of them got vaccine, the rest placebo. There is absolutely no indication of any significant, severe, long-term side effect. You may say, well, we've only studied them for three or four months. Couldn't something emerge a year later, two years later? And the answer is that's not impossible, but it would be it's nearly unprecedented in the world of vaccines. Most bad stuff happens in the first few months. And, the, you know, the, the problem is, you know, getting to complete certainty is hard. What we are certain about is COVID stinks, <laughs> is if you get COVID, the chances you will die are about one in 200. The chances you'll have a lingering chronic disease are, are maybe one in 20. Uh, and we don't know how long that's going to last. But a lot of people still feel terrible a few months later. There may be long-term heart effects, brain effects. We know all those things. Those, are, those we're sure about. And so to me, I understand the hesitancy, but to me, the minute it's my turn <laughs> to get my vaccine, I am getting my vaccine. There's just no question that the benefits of it far, far, far outweigh the risk. Thank you for that. I'm sure we'll have some more questions. I'm sure. Um, I want to turn to Dr. Abueleta next. And uh, we're, I guess we're saving the, well, I want to call it best, but Dr. Moss, you'll... Uh, you're, uh, you'll have some of the most difficult questions. But Dr. Abueleta, since you're, you're on the ground, not to say that our other folks aren't, but you are interacting with um, the portions of our district that are some of the hardest hit, that have had the highest infection rates and in fact, really tragically, some of the highest death rates. And what are you, what are you hearing? Are you hearing a willingness to be vaccinated? Are you... Uh, just share whatever you'd like right now, and then I'll ask you some specific questions about um, the, the contract tracing and such that you've been doing. But let's hear first. Sure. Thank you, Senator Smith, for having me. It's great to be on this panel. And yeah, I can offer some of what we're seeing on the ground. Certainly, we're very concerned with the increasing numbers. Uh, what we're seeing at our testing site is what we're seeing across the county. Um, our test results from last week had a positivity rate that was double the week before. Um, this is very, very concerning. And we know that the zip code that we sit in, uh, 94603 in East Oakland, and the two neighboring zip codes to that, uh, 621 and 601, are the heaviest hit actually in the entire county in terms of case rates and in terms of positivity rates. And that is absolutely what we're seeing at our testing site as well. So these are all very uh, concerning and certainly now, you know, more people are also coming to get tested, partly because they've been in contact with someone, uh, you know, or they're starting to get symptoms. And so we're glad that people are taking advantage of sort of the uh, testing capacity that we now have in our county, which has been really, really critical, I think, to at least being able to foresee what is going on. But keeping in mind that these numbers really don't yet reflect what happened over the holiday weekend. We know we heard, you know, over a million people traveling through United States Airport, people feeling free to travel sort of despite the fact that we have this pandemic pretty much raging out of control. And so we know that in the coming days, we'll start to see that reflected in terms of our positives and then, uh, you know, maybe in a week or two in terms of our hospital capacity. So 
all of this has us certainly concerned and embracing ourselves and, and that is reflected in terms of the people that are showing up to get tested and also, you know, our staff and those that are working there on the front line. Um, I would say in terms of the, um, you know, as we talk to people who are positive, um, both from notifying them as well as the contact tracing process, the number one uh, likely source is still the household. Um, number two is still the workplace. Um, but the gatherings and being in contact with someone outside the household is positive is really kind of gaining a little bit and getting pretty close to sort of what we're seeing in the workplace. And what I would say is because many of the people that uh, we serve and that we've tested are essential workers. They've been working, you know, since pretty much the entire pandemic and our workplace transmission is a, still a very big concern. Uh, we're not seeing the kind of workplace protections that we would like to see, um, at, particularly at this far into the pandemic. Uh, people don't have enough PPE, enough spacing, enough circulation. Um, there's too much crowding and we are not uh, seeing the kind of response to an outbreak that we would like to see um, at the level of the employer uh, notifying people and, and having people isolate and quarantine. And this is due to a variety of factors, not least of which is that people are afraid to lose income and may not tell their employer. Also, people are showing up to work sometimes with symptoms and that is very concerning. And that is oftentimes when we see that they then spread it to coworkers and things of that nature. So those are some of the report backs um, that we are hearing. And so, you know, it's still the same advice that people are so, so tired of hearing is what we need to keep saying. And so even in the midst of sort of everything that is going in the absolutely wrong direction, very concerning numbers, of course, we're encouraged by the vaccine developments. And uh, we are certainly, uh, you know, building the value of, you know, this, uh, the safety profile looks very good. We understand that there are still questions about how many doses will we need? Will, will, will we need boosters? You know, will there need to be, will this be annual? You know, those are some things we just don't quite know yet, but these are things that are knowable. And to Dr. Walker's point, these are sort of the least of some of the concerns that we have around what we, what we do know will happen uh, if you get COVID or if we exceed, you know, our, our hospital's ability to deal with new infections and so on. And so this is obviously tremendous in terms of development. I think what we're hearing is sort of like two ends of the spectrum. Either I'm never getting this vaccine, nobody's gonna get me to do this vaccine, this is experimentation and all of the reasons that we know that our community does not trust. And these are you know, really kind of like a well-earned mistrust in terms of the medical system just historically within our community, historically and contemporaneously, frankly, because with this pandemic, I think we have seen you know, folks come out of the, the woodwork in terms of, you know, either profiteering from the pandemic itself uh, or just, you know, spreading misinformation and so forth. And so that has just added to what was already a fairly shaky foundation, I would say. And so we, we hear that. And then on the other end is like, they better give me that vaccine. You know, I want to be in the front of the line. Why am I going to have to wait, you know, six months? And so I think we're hearing both ends of the spectrum. For the most part, the message that we are saying right now is, you know, you're not going to have to act on either of these feelings right now because it's going to be a little while probably before you're offered this vaccine. And by that time, we're going to have a lot more information and data. But the likelihood is that we are going to be strongly recommending that this is a vaccine that you're going to want to get. But we want to really be transparent about what we do know and about what we don't know. I think that is very, very critical because we cannot be, you know, attempting to oversell anything. There's still so much just about the virus itself. We don't know what other tricks it has up its sleeve. And so I think it's important that we be transparent. But certainly the safety profile um, is very, very encouraging. And that's what we've been really trying to get across right now is that it's not doing harm. Um, so I think that even once it is widely available, it's going to be a pretty heavy lift, you know, not just in terms of distribution, but in terms of just getting acceptance across the board. And so I think it's really going to take our community leaders, our community health centers, our faith institutions, uh, really informing ourselves, talking to one another, understanding what the objections are and doing what we can to overcome those objections. And I think, you know, really understanding that we don't know how long it will really take to get us to that 70% to that herd immunity. So we are still looking at a good number of months, if not longer, where we just have to follow the same old boring advice. And a big part of that is shelter in as much as you can whenever you can. And so I hear all the anxiety around, oh, can I go here? Can I go there? What are the rules? And I get it. 
um, and not to use extreme examples, but the countries that have done well in getting this thing under control have essentially shut down borders, reduced traveling, reduced mixing, and really imposed some, some lockdowns. That's not the only way to get there. It's not a way the U.S. is going to get there. I think that that is clear that we've not been able to do that in any kind of complete way. But to the extent that we can, it is still shelter in as much as you can, whenever you can, with members of your household and not others, because unfortunately we're seeing a lot more indoor gathering that is leading to positives and to outbreaks um, at people's homes and in events. And then obviously we know the masking up and the spacing out and really protecting our elders and those that we think are the most likely to do poorly. And I would say that the other thing is to, you know, isolate yourself, quarantine if you think you were exposed. Don't go around people and say, oh, well, I just thought it was, a, a, you know, we hear that a lot. Oh, well, I, I went to work the first couple of days, but I just thought it was a cold. Don't, don't, just think it's a cold. Go ahead and quarantine yourself, get tested, stay quarantined until you get your results. Because the other thing I want to say that we hear when we talk to people is the amount of suffering and guilt and devastation that is occurring within households where perhaps a child gave it to their parent who has now passed uh, who, or is in the ICU fighting for their life. This is something that uh, will never go away. And so I think it's just really prudent of us to realize it only takes that one time. That's another thing we hear a lot. I've been so good this whole time and then it was just this one time, you know, like you don't get credit for all those months that you did what you were supposed to do. It's really every day doing the best we can to do our part for ourselves and for those around us. I'm so pleased that you uh, were, you know, shared with us what you are hearing from your clients and the difficulties they're facing. But this is one question that I um, want to ask you. You indicated that, of course, you are strongly recommending us. Everyone on this panel, I know, would also is that if a person feels the least bit, either like the coming with the cold, coming down with the cold or the flu, because those symptoms are very similar to COVID symptoms, that they quarantine right away. Yes, get tested, fine, but quarantine. Now, we know, as you mentioned, that many of the people who are most, who are getting this virus the most are people that are still having to go to work. And that under the stay-at-home order, so <clears throat> for example, under the stay-at-home order, grocery stores are still open, certain stores are still open, and a lot of these uh, workers, especially that you that uh, your clinic serves, they are still having to go there. So the question is, if they then quarantine, they're out of work, and most of many of these type of jobs don't give sick leave. So is there still a program? where folks can get some compensation if they quarantine? Yes, there is still compensation that is offered by Alameda County of $1,250 if you are positive um, so that you stay at home. What I will say and what I want to clarify okay. too is when I... How can you let, how do people, how can they get that or how do they find out about that? So that everybody... They, yes, they will find out when they test positive. So when we notify folks that they are positive or when the contact tracer contacts them, that is when it's a very quick uh, referral process and, and it is working very, very well. So you do have to test positive. You're uh, not going to take the good. The good lesson there is that it's worth it to get tested because if you're tested and if you unfortunately test positive, you at least would be able to access some remuneration so that you can stay home and protect yourself and your family and others. Absolutely. I think the other thing I want to say is that when we say exposure, you know, that really means that you had close contact, you didn't have the appropriate PPE on, and you were either in a closed space or too close to someone for too long without the appropriate PPE. This should not be happening at work. This should not be happening at work. So if you are working, you should have the appropriate PPE. You should not be getting exposed to anyone that is not wearing, you know, a mask, and you shouldn't be forced to be in a situation where you are getting exposed. One of the culprits, is the break room. Yes. The other culprit is the carpooling. So those are areas that employers don't necessarily feel responsible over, but I think that those are important things that, that we should be talking about as well. So people are protecting themselves and not getting exposed and not having to get into that situation of needing to quarantine. So the message is, if you are still someone who has to go to work, <clears throat> don't go and eat a meal in the break room or take the lunch break with your other colleagues in an enclosed space where you take your mask off. Don't do that. Is that correct? Don't do it. 
And if you are going to carpool, then you must wear your mask. And I would guess even have your windows open. Have your windows down. Absolutely. So just because you get off at five, you know, doesn't mean that now all the workplace, you know, rules that were put in place, you can just uh, ignore them. You know, those are meant to keep you safe. So keep those masks on and keep the windows down. And ideally don't be in an enclosed space unless you feel pretty certain about somebody else's risk rate of risk as well. Okay, great. Now, now we'll turn to Dr. Moss. Now, Dr. Moss, you have the, uh, in a way, the most difficult job here because the type of questions we have received and um, are things like that the, if, for example, you go up to the various websites to try to find the direction around the stay-at-home order and it's not simple and concise, it's confusing, that's some of the complaint or question we've had. We've also had the question of, well, wait a minute, everyone has told us that outdoors is the safe space, that if we're distance, if we're wearing a mask, if we're outdoors, that's safe. But look, now playgrounds are closed. We're being told that we can't, uh, you know, meet a friend outside. Um, so these are the, some of the things that people are raising and they're saying, how can it be, how can you justify keeping a retail operation open if you're closing a playground? So I'm going to, I just start with that, Dr. Moss. So as you make your comments, you already prepared with what kind of things you should be addressing. Go ahead. Uh, well, thank you for having me, Senator Skinner. Um, and um, uh, it's uh, great to follow Dr. Walker, who's uh, explained this thing so clearly. And also our, our close partner, Dr. Abelada, who's been doing a lot of the, the critical work in, in some of our most impacted communities here. And, um, and uh, so, um, you know, with regards to the, the overall message, I know it's confusing, lots of rules, they've been changing all year round, first this, then that, but the, the overall message right now is that we're in a very uh, difficult situation. This is the worst things have been here in Alameda County and, and across the Bay Area. We are uh, having much higher numbers of cases reported every day. We have the most people in the hospital that we've ever had. The overall message is please stay home or stay where you live. That's the easiest way to avoid mixing with other people in situations where COVID really easily spreads. And we're hoping that, you know, we'll only be back in this situation for a matter of weeks to get things cooled down so we can protect our healthcare system and, and protect our medically vulnerable community members. The risk is, is not trivial with this much virus out there. And so, um, we can we can dig into the rules and some of the things that are open and closed, but but the, the bottom line is we 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 just need people to stay home right now, and um, and uh, really keep it to their own households. I know that's hard for people. It's been a very difficult year. It's been a very isolating year for people who who live alone. It has been extremely difficult on many of our businesses, and and we've asked so much, and now we're asking a little bit more, but. This is a lot more, really. But this, uh, you know, this is uh, the thing that has worked. The piecemeal approach, where we, you know, open this sector and then that sector, open dining, open movie theaters. You know, that that's okay when there's uh, lower amounts of virus circulating. When we're in a sort of more of a reopening phase, but but right now th that is not enough to contain what we have what we see in our communities, what we see circulating. And so um, it, it's really about keeping people at home with just their own household members as much as possible until we get through this most, most difficult period of the pandemic so far. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Um, for those of you who may have joined us uh, midway, I'm Senator Nancy Skinner. This is my 10th uh, town hall that my staff and I have put together and we clearly did it because of the rising rates of COVID and the new orders that all of us are being asked. And we had wonderful panelists so far. That was Dr. Nicholas Moss, who is the uh, health director for County Alameda County Public Health. And we heard from Dr. Abuleta, who is um, with Roots Community Clinic in East Oakland and Dr. Wachter, who is uh, UCSF um, infectious disease specialist, and he talked about vaccines. But I'm going to go back to Dr. Moss because Dr. Moss is in the uh, unenviable position of being uh, one of the county public health officials 
who issued this order and has indicated to all of us that, for example, um, we are, you know, in effect, not to gather with people from any other household, only our own household. We've been asked now, don't go to the gym. Don't, uh, here's a question for you. What about outdoor fitness classes? For a while there, <clears throat> outdoor fitness classes were being allowed. Are those being allowed? So um, uh, what we are trying to do in Alameda County, and uh, this is true for all of the Bay Area health jurisdictions that uh, made the move to the, um, the state's uh, regional shelter at home restrictions uh, this week, we're really following uh, what the state has uh, set out in their orders um, to the greatest extent possible. We think that's important for consistency above all else with each other and with um, what the state is doing. Those, those restrictions are now in effect in Southern, all of Southern California and all of the Southern Central Valley as well. Um, so we're not alone in this. Um, and um, the state has included some areas that they've allowed. So some outdoor activities with your immediate household are permitted and, and we do, that's important. That's important. And those are, do you wanna just mention what those sure. are? Sure, uh, so um, the, um, it's really anything that um, um, you can you can get outdoor exercise at an individual level. You can you can walk with your family. The state has um, really asked people to not sort of sit down in parks or sit down at beaches. It's more about walking, active exercise. The state has um, created a space for outdoor physical fitness classes, um, um, dance classes, things like that. Very limited. There's uh, opportunities for also youth sports training, um, but no competition. But but I, I really want to you know the, the, there's I really want to emphasize that that this is these are important outlets for people. We know that, but but the overall message is to to stay home and avoid mixing as much as possible. Now another question that a lot of people have asked is, under the order, childcare that. Uh, was open is still being allowed to stay open. Mm -hmm. um, however, the rule on schools is that only schools that were previously open can continue. And many people have pointed out that most of the schools that were previously open were private schools, not public schools. So talk about the justification for that. The difference why childcare, not schools, and why schools only that were previously and not yeah, schools has been uh, one of the most complex areas that we've been involved in. Um, and um, it's something that I, I actually spend a lot of my time on. Um, so, uh, and we are following the state here. We are, uh, the state has not changed their school um, policies with this uh, shelter at home order, but we are still subject to the state's purple tier restrictions. They're very specific. Schools that have not opened yet for counties that are in the purple tier in the state's reopening framework cannot open in that while we're in that purple tier. Once we get back to the red tier, uh, regardless of what's going on with this shelter at home order, um, then schools will be able to begin reopening again. Uh, and so um, we're just, we're following the state here. Um, but one other thing I'll say is that we do know that schools can be um, open safely and operated safely. We've seen examples of that both uh, overseas, but also here in the United States. And if the right procedure is in place, um, it can be done. We're, we're absolutely supportive of that here in Alameda County. The one caveat is right now we have the most, um, the highest rates of COVID in the county that we've ever seen. We have rising rates. It is not a stable situation. Uh, a lot of the evidence that there is, such as it is for schools, um, has been from areas where there was more stable transmission. That's not true in all cases, but you know I think people need to realize that that this is not business as usual, even for this past uh, year of, of the COVID pandemic. And so um, we're really looking forward in Alameda County to getting back to opening things that we can as soon as we can. But again, we're really trying to stick as close as possible to the state restrictions and we cannot be less restrictive than the state by law. That's, they set the floor. Okay, okay. So now um, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions, but Dr. Abelada and uh, Dr. Wachter, if there's anything you wanna jump in on, uh, feel free. Um, so the, another thing that people emailed us on is that, so there's a travel restriction, but some people indicated, Hey, I have a, uh, I've either rented a vacation house 
or I have a vacation house and I was hoping to use it say during the week of, you know, the Christmas and New Year's and we, and that their plan was to bring all their own food, to be only with their family and they wouldn't be, you know, going out and such. Is, is that prohibited? And if so, why? Yeah, so uh, there's, uh, there is data and research uh, from, um, it, that's been published about uh, really uh, how uh, the, the more mobile people are, the more people are out and about, um, the more that you can see um, spread of the virus between communities. Now I understand, you know, in this particular case, um, you know, the, 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 the questioner has a, a great plan in place to keep them and their family safe, but um, you know, it's 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 very hard to set these kinds of policies for at the individual level. And so the state has included a travel restriction as part of their shelter at home order. I think it, it is appropriate in this case. Um, you know, there, there really may be limited circumstances, for instance, within a single county where, you know, you could, if you have a, a, another property in the same county, but we're really um, I'm asking people to stay home. And I know this is disrupting a lot of people's uh, holiday plans, and um, at a, it's a time when people really, you know, it's, it's very special for a lot of families, um, and, and it's a sacrifice. But uh, I think by doing this, we are really, we're protecting our community members who are medically vulnerable at greatest risk for the severe outcomes of COVID. We're protecting those essential workers that, that have to go to work, that went in those um, industries that, that we really do want to keep running because they support all of us and our health. And so the more we can get the virus, uh, circulating virus levels down, the more we can protect those people. And, and that is gonna mean making some sacrifices. So the other question is, you know, essential travel is allowed. So we know essential workers, and I know that one of the questions has always been, okay, what's essential? Uh, so first, you know, give your definition of essential travel, and then where's the best site? My staff and I, we sent in our email inviting people to this town hall, we had a little chart that we actually found from someone else that listed what's open, what's essential, what isn't. Mm -hmm. um, now, whether that's complete enough, I, I will tell you, I don't fully know, mm -hmm. but first your definition of essential travel and then the best site you would recommend people to go to if they're trying to figure out like, am I an essential worker or not? Yeah, that's great. So it's, it points to just how confusing this whole thing is and how challenging it's been for people to stay on top of the rules. And one of the reasons that, first of all, we in Alameda County are moving to be in alignment with the state as, as much as possible is just so, you know, that there's less of that sort of, well, it says this on your website, but that on their website, um, the state is still making adjustments to their website. I know with this uh, new order and people are acting very fast because the situation is so critical. And so, um, you know, I appreciate everyone's patience as we as we get some of those uh, reference materials uh, um, updated. Um, uh, and it's a, also along the same lines, it's why we wanna really act uh, similarly to Contra Costa County, City of Berkeley, with whom we really try to move in lockstep and also Santa Clara County, um, several other counties in the Bay Area, really trying to be consistent with each other um, for with the implementation of all these rules to the greatest extent possible. So essential travel is travel to complete um, any of those essential activities that are allowed, for example, dropping your children off at school or, or going to the grocery store to, to buy stuff. Those are, those are allowed activities, essential activities. So travel to do those things is allowed. Similarly, if you work in a critical infrastructure um, industry and the state has a website, you can search California uh, COVID critical infrastructure, you get a whole website list of those those industries and within each it, it describes specifically what what counts. Um, that work is uh, travel for that work is 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 fine and, and, and is appropriate, even if it means you know, leaving the county going up and down the state. And so this is much more focused on a recreational travel, um, even within the county. Um, and um, and and not so much on travel to support you know your essential essential needs, um, and uh, and and I you know again uh, we we realize that the the information and navigation is sometimes hard. We do have a list of what's allowed and what's not allowed in Alameda County on our uh, 
uh, acphd.org website on our program. That's acphd.org. That's okay. Alameda County Public Health website that has that information. Okay. Um, uh, another question that came up, or well, you mentioned the state is modifying the rules in effect, uh, the first announcement of this came last Friday, I believe, last Thursday or Friday, that we would start to go into effect. And initially it was that the Bay Area might not until the middle of December, but then the Bay Area decided to as of yesterday, meaning that we all went under the same order as of Monday, except for Marin, which only started today, but let's, we'll let that go, I think, by now, by today all of the counties in around us are part of it um though i think san mateo may not have but whatever we'll leave that alone but the um first rule initially the state said all retail grocery stores everything the pharmacies everything would only be allowed to be 20 percent capacity now i understand they've revised it so that grocery stores can be up to 35 percent capacity is there any other retail operation that can be higher than 20% capacity right now? Uh, uh, that's correct. Uh, the grocery store uh, limit, that makes sense. You want to really don't want to limit people's access to food in particular. And also, I, you know, you may have stood in these grocery store lines yourself. So I think there's an argument to keeping people moving, not having people sort of congregating out there on the sidewalk. It's not really the same situation for a lot of other retailers, but for grocery stores, that that that, that does happen. Um, uh, so um, I'm not aware of any other um, retail okay. sector where that um, where that that um, restriction has been um, changed. Uh, it's standalone grocery stores in the state. Okay, world. standalone. Okay, okay. Good to know. Good to know. And um, the. The other thing, let's see. Well, here's just a general question. And Dr. Abolada, Dr. Wachter, you can. So we've both gotten some emails with this. And then I've heard on the news too, similar <clears throat> expressions that um, that the kind of order we're under now is like telling teenagers to have abstinence. It's like, the, it's like sex education gone wrong. That somehow if we tell um, we say, you know, just say no, all abstinence, that that never works, that we should be practicing harm reduction, and that this order is like that. It's basically saying no to everything, and that then people will get mistrust or distrust for their uh, to follow health orders. Any comment that any of you want to make about that? And Dr. Wachter and, Wachter and Dr. Abo Lada, you'd be will, uh, you're more than welcome to also join in if you want. Yeah, no, I get it. I, I, I don't agree with it because I, I think the analogy to, for example, HIV or sexually transmitted diseases is, is an imperfect analogy where you are telling somebody to avoid what many people see as a very pleasurable behavior forever. And we're talking about getting people to limit a certain kinds of activities for a few weeks, maybe a month or so. I think it's actually even, I mean, this whole thing is brutal, but if it were, um, you know, if we'd been talking about this a month ago, we would have said, and it's possible we're going to have to do this again in April, and it's possible we're going to have to do it again next summer. I really do think that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel here. And so, you know, of course, it, it, makes, us, it makes sense to try to be careful about how many things you're asking people to do. And if you ask them to do too much and it's too brutal, they may just sort of say, I'm, I'm not going to follow any of it. It's overwhelming. But I think the state and the city and the counties have been thoughtful about how they draw the lines. Uh, there are a lot of things that you are allowed to do. And we're talking about trying to get through through the holidays, really, at which point I think there's every reason to believe we've done this twice before in the Bay Area, that the cases will come down, life will go back towards something resembling normal, and then we will be much closer to the end here with, as a vaccine begins to roll out. So I, it doesn't feel like a perfect ana analogy to me. 
Okay, yeah, I would have to agree with that. I think the other reason why it's not a great analogy is because your behavior has impact on absolutely everyone else, potentially that you come around, that you breathe near, you know, et cetera. And so I think our notion around individualism and per personal freedoms and things like that is very challenged in this particular situation because, uh, you know, it is just not the fact that you're only harming yourself. You could potentially be harming another, a number of other people. And in my mind, I think, you know, uh, you know, if we were being extreme as maybe as I would have liked to see us be, we would have shut down the airports for a period of time. We would have absolutely stopped travel. Um, you know, we would have done some things that would not be probably acceptable in this country um, so that we could get back to normal sooner. So I think the paradox here also is as well as if you choose to not do this, we're going to be in this longer. And so that is the other reality I think people need to kind of accept. Good, good point. Um, Dr. Moss, any last comments before we wrap? Just to say how grateful I am for, for what people have done here locally, um, our, our residents and, and also our, our business community and our, our health care partners uh, to, to, to get everybody through. Um, we're, we're doing it for each other and, and I think we've, we've done great so far. Um, I, I, I'm really grateful for that. For that effort. Well, I really appreciate all of you participating. I'm sure the folks that joined us while I, you know, I'm uh, given that we've been under some level of restrictions as has been talked about for a good nine months now. And it is, uh, all of us get a little tired of it. Um, but I think the takeaway message really is, is that if we want to get back to more semi-normalcy then the better we can abide by what we're being asked for now over this next four weeks, that the more we can actually just stay with our own household and, and if we, when and if we do go out, that we wear our masks and we go out as infrequently as possible and we keep our physical distance, that we are likely to have such restrictions lifted much quicker. So I think that's really the message and that uh, I think we are just going to have to look forward to Zoom holiday celebrations. Uh, and of course, there's always FaceTime by the phone if you don't want to use a laptop for Zoom. There's lots of ways that we can interact with our family and friends who are not in our household. Um, so I think that's the other good message. But I want to thank Dr. Moss, the Health Director of Alameda County, thank Dr. Abalata, who is our Roots Community Clinic CEO and founder, and thank Dr. Wachter from UCSF for your participation today. And I would also say that we will have another town hall just on the vaccines because this was a very good discussion that we've had so far. And we do know that there will be vaccines in California this month However, we also know that it's going to be a very limited number and set of people who will get them this month. However, potentially starting January, February, that, that uh, the population who may be available to get vaccines may very much be enlarged and how they're distributed, all those questions will be on everybody's mind. So, and I know that's still being rolled out. I mean, our president-elect Biden has a task force that he started on November the 9th, where they're looking at, you know, improved testing, both uh, return results quicker access. They're looking at the vaccine distribution. They're looking at all those things. And plus, of course, the state of California has a vaccination task force and has is going to be uh, reviewing all of the safety protocols before they recommend those vaccines to any of, you know, before they really distribute them to us. So all of those things are still a work in progress, even with the good results that we have from both the Pfizer and the Moderna, it's a work in progress. So we will have another town hall on vaccinations alone. But so far, I think you've been really good messengers just to reiterate to all of us, be patient, enjoy being home as much as you can, just accept that we're being asked to do this for another four weeks and that if we do it, we will get through this. And thank you all. And thank my staff for putting this together and the uh, state Senate uh, Democratic Caucus for being our technological people to keep our Zoom working. So thank you all.
Thank you. Thank you. We'll sign off.